Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators, and we've all worked for just about every major publisher in the business. In fact, we probably can't think of any we haven't worked for. Uh, We have all taught illustration at universities, and together we've published somewhere around 100 books. Each week, we pick a different topic in illustration, and we bat it around, smush it, cook it, and see what happens. I can't wait for the podcast called, the podcast show called Three Point Perspective are charlatans, and every episode is them like debunking and taking us to task on everything we said in the last episode. Is is there a certain (laughs) level of fame we got to hit to get to that point where we're basically- this podcast is so popular. Um, there's just, you know, well, it's like that, are, co- like Coffeezilla. You, 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 you hit me to that guy. That's right. Uh, on YouTube yeah. where he, he goes after um, people that make fraudulent claims online selling stuff. Mm-hmm. He's good. It's, huh? it's pretty, it's pretty entertaining. It's fun. It makes you realize yeah. like how unscrupulous some people are. Yeah. He's even but, had people on his show that he's taken to task. And because they have, they actually have good moral character. They like have come on his show, mm-hmm. and to to one to guy apologized and said, "Yeah, here, here's what actually ha- you're right about this, but I, I actually have a legitimate product, and here's why." And they've had so there's more. Is there more to the story? I mean, do 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 people come around to those people who defend themselves in that way? I mean, most of them are scammers. I think that he exposes. Hmm. Yeah, his yeah. whole thing is like weeding out who actually has a product to sell and they're doing, you know, they're doing real work and who's like the third generation who like took a class from a person who took a class from a person who took a class of that person. And they're like selling like this watered down version of whatever mm-hmm. it is mm. that, that they're doing. Right. Um, I don't know that it's kind of what I gathered from it in a nutshell. So today we got some more questions from the mailbag. Can't wait to dig into these. You guys ready? Yeah. Let's dive in. Question number one. Uh, this is from Kyle. It's titled, I look like a damn amateur. <laughs> Great title. Sh- short and sweet. He says, hi, I'm wondering why my art always feels amateurish. Feel like no matter what I do, I can't make it look professional. So what? <laughs> what's going on? I mean, he didn't give us a sample of his work, so we can't critique it, but... Um, I think there's two things here. There's feeling like it looks amateurish and actually looking amateurish. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So to solve the first one, if if you feel like it is, you know, you need to get an outside opinion and ask a professional, ask two or three professionals and say, does my work look professional? And they will give you the, the validation that you need that it does or, um, probably some pointers and some ideas on why it doesn't. So I think that's how you solve that side of it is how you, you feel about it. Because a lot of times I think artists can get down on their work because we're always comparing ourselves to, you know, our heroes, our art heroes and looking at, you know, these beautiful pieces that are being posted on Instagram or, or posted on, you know, people's websites and, and Facebook. And you just like, how can this person draw so well? And then you sit down and do your own drawing. And you're like, I'm no good. I even struggle with that. But I also know that because I have been paid to do work, some of my work is professional level. So, um, so I think you just need to get an outside opinion on that. Um, what do you do to, I guess, uh, take your work to the next level? What are some things to look at um, to to make it to make it get into that professional zone? I think that what the, what it says to me is somebody has not done enough master copies. I'm a big fan mm-hmm. of the master copy. It really mm-hmm. gives you a guide, and not just blindly copying. And just saying, okay, I did the match and I did a pretty good job. Okay, what is my work going to be better now? It, the real work for a master copy comes into, first you do the copy, and then you do the analysis of the work. And you have to mm-hmm. say, like I did I did a, a Bart Forbes master copy during my graduate program. And then I've made a little guide 
maybe I can even put it in the show notes because I still have it. But it's I analyzed, okay, here's how he's handling his color. Here's how he's handling his texture. Here's how he's handling his edges. Here's how he's handling his composition. And so where is the magic in a Bart Forbes piece? So I would analyze one piece and then I would get another one of his pieces and see like a hypothesis almost. Okay, do these same things hold up in the next piece? And then I'd see, oh wait, no, he changed this one thing. So throw that out. He changed this thing. And pretty soon I end up with a true common denominator checklist almost for how this person is making these images. Mm. And then, so I then started checking my own work against those, some of those same common denominators if I wanted to go in that direction of Bart Forbes or whichever illustrator you're kind of looking for. And that way um, you're, you're picking out the stuff that you think is the most important things and applying it to your work. And it gave me a one-to-one checklist, um, which is much different than, oh, I just did a copy, but then none of the, none of the copy comes with you if you don't do the analysis. Um, right. And it's an easy one. You can you can always do it. I think it should be a standing assignment, especially in your amateur years as you're as you're learning. Just do the master copies. Pick a bunch of different artists, of course, the artists that you really like, and then really look deep and say why are they doing. Put your image even next to theirs and say what's the difference. You'll spot it pretty quick. Mm-hmm. That's good. There's there's a there's a level of of um, commitment and craftsmanship to every aspect of creating an illustration from the concept, starting with the concept, working through the design. So the design is a whole nother part that requires a lot of craftsmanship and attention and commitment. The, the final drawing and then the final rendering and each one is a specific um, um, task that, uh, with, that has a start to finish. And I, one, one thing in general is I, you know, professionals are just in general spending more time than amateurs. And mm-hmm. uh, so if you say your artwork is looking amateurish and and even if the amateur is spending, you know, for a character spending 10 or, you know, five or 10 hours, the pro is if the pro is also spending five or 10 hours, the pro's time is so much more efficient mm-hmm. that they're they're actually doubling your your time. You, as an amateur, you should be willing to spend two or three times the time that a professional is spending be- to get to that level of efficiency. Um, and and I, you know, and I, I was having a conversation with a student today, and you know, his his work was, um, I w- I would say amateurish, you know, and I I I told him I I picked one of his best pieces, and and everyone knows the best piece in their portfolio. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Especially, especially when you're up and coming, because one thing that up and comers all have in common is they have one or two pieces that are better than all the rest mm-hmm. because they're, they're making leaps and bounds. They're making huge when they, when they, when they do a, a piece that's better than everything else, it's because they're still having these uh, huge epiphanies in their work. Whereas the, the professional who's been a professional for 30 years, they're doing the same quality work day in and day out. And they really don't have huge, those huge leaps in improvement anymore. So if you have, if you know what the two, one or two best pieces in your portfolio are, and you want to get a review to, to, to get your work to the next level, the first thing you can always say to yourself, because I'm going to, if, if I do a review and this is what I said, this guy this morning is, well, first off, you know, which one is, which, which is your best piece? Cause I already know which one it is. Which one do you think it is? He picks which one it is. I go, exactly. So you already know that's your best piece. Mm-hmm. How come all the others aren't up to its level? That's your first task is creating, is throwing away everything you've done and bring everything in your portfolio up to that level. Then your next task is in the next year or two, completely throwing that portfolio away and replacing it with, with better pieces. And, um, and what and when you're the specific thing to when you're when you're identifying what will make your portfolio better, it's really your standards. Your standards have to go up on each level. Your own personal standards on what you're willing to get away with and what you're willing to let slide and not slide. And you mentioned edges, Lee. A lot big part of it is it's just edges. Uh, when you're talking about the craftsmanship part of it, but if you're talking about the the concept part 
I see so many students that are willing to, <laughs> to go with a really stupid idea for their, for their, uh, for their illustration when they're trying to, to illustrate a, a concept or an idea. And, and that part's harder because mm-hmm. that's, that's your life experiences that give you, that help you develop good concepts. But it's tough, but to, tough to recognize with, it, you know, the concepts you know, I, that when that when you're early in your career. Yeah. Um, and I showed this student, um, Piper Thibodeau's portfolio. Mm-hmm. You know, he's just saying, he's looking at it and he's like, oh my gosh, these are so clever. And, and that's one thing that stands out in her work. They're so clever. And I'm like, so you're, you're responding right away to how clever her, her art is, but you're not getting completely sucked into just the craftsmanship of it. It's the, how clever it is. And, and so if you start with a concept, that's not, not a good concept, not a good story. No one's going to care about it. No one's going to want to, you know, that's the first step in an amateur work is, or staying amateur is that your concept is, is, is there, is, is there amateur. any, is there any theme that an amateur artist tend to gravitate towards that you can think of that they do? That's like an, like a pro would recognize it as an amateur piece. Mm, for, for, for me, it's a storyline. That's not believable. <laughs> a story that just right away is like, people don't do that or, or that character wouldn't do that. It's, it's, out, it's not in character for the real world. Mm. That that's for, for me. That's what I see. A lot I tell you, there's, there's one piece I used to see a lot as a, at, when I would teach freshman classes in particular, uh, uh, to solve an illustration problem. Um, a lot of new artists will do it. Not that this can't be done well, but just, I just noticed it where they solve a lot of problems with like somebody looking in a mirror and then the mirror is reflecting back something different. It always has uh-huh. to do with an, a, a reflection. Like it's yeah. a close up of an eye and the eye is now reflecting the scene and it's a murder mystery. And you know what I mean? Just like, always, which is a super hard thing to draw. But for yeah. some reason, early artists are really attracted to drawing something in a mirror or drawing something in a reflection of an eye. So if you're yeah. doing that, either do it really, really well, or maybe back away from I mean, that's a sort of a hallmark of a beginner concept in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I think too that some of the beginner stuff is is a image that doesn't, especially if they want to be an illustrator, an image that doesn't even tell a story. You know, so it might be like just a hand holding a rose. It might be mm. a fine picture of a hand holding a rose, but there's no story there. There's 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 nothing to it, and and it may show your technical ability, but it doesn't show your storytelling ability. So, I think that's super important is to like. Every one of your, if if you're wanting to get into illustration, whether it's children's books, comic books, uh, you know, editorial, any you know, book covers, all of your illustrations have to be telling some part of a story, some chunk of a story where the person looking at it is thinking, "Oh my gosh, I know what just happened," or "Oh my gosh, you know, I know what's about to happen based on the information I'm getting right here." So. Right. There's one okay. other thing that I, I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Let me just add one more little thing. Um, a thing that I've noticed over time that professionals, not just illustrators, but professionals in almost any field, whether it's like woodworking or even electricians or plumbers or whatever, but when somebody's a pro, their willingness to just scrap something that's not working and start over is mm-hmm. really quick. I mean, they'll, mm-hmm. and without even thinking about it. And and, mm-hmm. I, and I've seen that in my own work. Like, oh, you know, I do a, a painting. It doesn't work. I do another painting. It doesn't work. And I'm just like burning through this. I remember there was one painting in particular when I was just learning watercolor. I mean, I did it probably 13 times, the full finished painting. <laughs> and I finally got what I wanted because <laughs> like, I just couldn't get there. But I, but I never thought about not doing another one of the paintings until it mm-hmm. got there. You know what I mean? It was just like, yeah. oh, it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work. But well, amateur is really so clean. Good, that's why it's so good. <laughs> to to add to that, a little add-on, is that the pro, the pro stays in the rough sketch stage and doesn't allow themselves to put an investment into starting Too much of a an finish, illustration yeah. and put hours in and then scrap it. Mm-hmm. So the pro yeah. will see the problems quicker and move on That's before true. there's an investment. Yeah. Right, right. It's like um, the amateur starts building the house and then does the blueprint as things get a little weird like oh shoot let's look and see (laughs) um okay let's move up to the next one so we can wrap this up by saying 
you need to have really good paint skills and then great concepts. <laughs> <Is that fair? laughs> yeah. You know, your problem is, is your, your paint skills aren't that good and, and your concepts are bad. So just fix that. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> the thing we, we can laugh because we've all been there oh yeah. it's painful i have it's turned painful. in so many stinkers and you know and and we laugh because we're in a place now where we're we're comfortable i mean you should never be comfortable as an artist right i mean you should never be you've never arrived but you're you're i mean i think we're all at the stage where if we set out to make a, a really good image we can get there without making fully creating an image and then scrapping it and then starting right. over making mm -hmm. another one. And that is, I mean, I'm telling you, that is a comfortable place to be in when you're making art because the, I remember those times where I'm like, I really hope this one turns out. <laughs> I really hope it turns out, you know, like, like there's a luck factor to it. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you realize later on, there's not a luck factor to making a great image. You know, there's a process. You can do it consistently if yeah. you know what you're right. doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question. This is from Mallory. It's titled Reproducing Alligator Skin. Just listened to the episode, Am I on the Right Path? And I would love to hear you guys expound on the last question, how art is reproduced. As an illustrator, probably 90% of our work is not going to be seen in the original, only in reproduction and print. So I think it's super important for illustrators to understand how their work will look in a sense, or media is not uh, our media is not just ink or oils or pixels, but the printed end result. Um, you flew by terms like dot gain and stuff like that. I would love to hear you go more into depth on the technical side of this. Any tips you have about certain colors or techniques that reproduce well or don't, et cetera, and in what circumstances? So um, she says she's a traditional only illustrator. She works in ink and oil paint, so she'd love any tips on how to actually do the work to maximize the odds of it reproducing well, not just mm. how to get good scans of finished work. So mm. I might take a step back because most of my stuff is predominantly digital. Um, you know, I can talk a little bit about how to make sure your digital stuff looks good in print, but I'm really curious about you two who, who work a way more in traditional with watercolor, with oils, things like that. I know you've, you've had a, a pass with that will though. You're mostly digital now, Yeah. but I'm curious what you guys think. I think this is more for Lee. I haven't been doing traditional for so long. Yeah. But the, no, the, her point though, is even if you're working in pixels, it's still, you know, if it's for print, it's not going to be seen in the format that you made it. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's always, there's always concessions you're going to have to give mm -hmm. for, for it changing from one format to mm -hmm. the other. So I'll speak to that a little bit. One thing is just getting it in to the computer. If you're working traditionally, um, what I recommend is if, if you're working smaller than 11 by 17, scan it. It's always going to be the easiest one. Buy an 11 by 17 scanner. They're so cheap now. I mean, 250 bucks can get you a great one in terms of resolution. No problem. It'll scan great. Um, do some paper tests to see how the texture scans, because sometimes that can get in the way if the texture over scans on a piece of paper, like a, like a heavy textured watercolor paper, for example, may not scan that well. So do some scans just with some simple tests, see which paper is going to work better. But scans always going to be better. If you're working bigger, like I was doing for books and some fine art stuff, um, I'd take it outside on a sunny day or you can set up, set up lights. That's a whole another deal. Just do a Google search for that. But I record my image in sections as I move around the, um, the image with the camera. So I'll take like, say for example, I'll cut it into quarters and that way I'll combine it in Photoshop and I'll get this huge, beautiful file. And I still always have to go back in and adjust the color. And so what, what I learned to do over time is to shoot a Basically, uh, uh, if, if you Google like a photo card or I don't know what it's called, but it's like a card with like the grayscale mm -hmm. and a bunch of color swatches, swatches and then a bunch of photographs on, on that image. And I shoot that at the same time I'm shooting my artwork. And then I adjust for that, that page and make sure that page looks good. And then my image looks great mm -hmm. um, because it's all shot at the same time. Bring it in. And then you, that's when you have a, a good scan. You're always going to have to adjust it. There's no camera or no scanner that's going to scan perfectly or take the photograph perfectly. You're always going to have to mess with it in the computer. 
try to get it as good as you can. Once it's in the um, digital format and you're going to send it to print, it's going to be CMYK. And I always just lighten it 10% more mm. than I think I need to. So the image looks a little bit light. My reasoning is if it prints a little bit light, typically that's okay. If it prints too dark, it looks like garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of how I lean mm. um, when I'm making stuff for print. One thing I'll add too is is if you're painting with any sort of metallic or shimmery colors, um, mm-hmm. forget about it. It's not, <laughs> it is not going to come out in print. It's not even going to come out. If you take a photo of it and post it online, that, that, you know, digital just can't capture what, what's happening with the light bouncing off of those like shimmery, mm-hmm. shimmery colors. It's, so it's, it's a good point. You should keep it matte as long as you can to photograph it. That's another little thing to mm-hmm. add. If you're working in acrylic or oil, make sure they're matte. Don't go for the glossy paints. Um, cause they are really tough to, mm-hmm. to photograph. They reflect and it's awful. That was yeah. a mistake I made early on when I was, when I was, uh, painting in acrylic, I would put this glossy, um, gloss medium over it at the mm-hmm. end because I loved how rich it made it all looks the great look. yeah <clears throat> and then I I made the mistake of trying to get them scanned and there was all this noise you know they in the print industry they call that noise when you get reflections mm-hmm. and uh, I realized I, c- I couldn't do that until after I had them scanned so I'll, one thing too that I want to tell everybody that's like it, I have pulled my hair out dealing with this problem and that is, I always work, when I'm working digitally, I always work in RGB because you can, there's just a broader range of colors you can get when you work in RGB. RGB stands for red, blue, green, essentially. And red, when green. you work at CMYK, or red, green, blue. <laughs> <I'm>, yeah. <laughs> red, blue, green, whatever. <laughs> blue, your list. <laughs> your list, list of, yeah. Um, <laughs> You get access to millions of colors um, when you're working digitally, and you can get just these sharp, like striking neons and glows and things like that that you just can't get with with CMYK. So, um, so you you got to be wa- watch out for any sort of um, colors that that are way saturated because they're not going to show up in CMYK. But the thing that, that that gets me is when you're delivering files for print, you have to then transition, or, or uh, not transition, but convert these files to CMYK so that the printer knows how to divide these colors up into black, cyan, magenta, and yellow, right? And, um, and what happens when you sh- convert to CMYK and the Photoshop file isn't flattened is it gets so dull and so muddy because it's trying to do it to each individual layer. And the, and, and there was just these images where I'm like, it cannot look this bad. What did I do wrong? You know, how am I, how, you know, how am I going to get it to look as sharp or or get even close? Cause, cause it wasn't doing it. And what I found the workaround is you actually flatten the image first and then you convert it to CMYK and it like bakes in all the different layers that you put in there and it gets not exactly close, but so much closer than converting an unflattened file to CMYK. So that's, that's my Jake Parker pro tip for converting to CMYK. And you should, you should definitely look into flattening first. I would save also a separate file, like an RGB file, and then your your CMYK file so that you don't save over your RGB because you never know if you need to like go in and adjust stuff. And the reason you always do want to keep RGB is say the print, the publisher or the print project or whatever you want to do a PDF version or a digital version. It's just going to look way better as a RGB file than as a CMYK file in digital. You know, if you post on Instagram, if you post on your, your website, you're going to want to post RGB files and then leave CFYK just strictly for anything that goes to print. Yeah, let me add to that too, that the RGB file is what you're going to use if you're going to make a print run of an image. Mm. So I always keep the RGB. It's weird, though, because the home printers also use CMYK as inks. As you guys know, if you've got a, a printer, that's the colors of the ink. But for some reason, the profiles are made 
for RGB, mm-hmm. which I've, n- I've never understood why it's not a one-to-one with CMYK and mm-hmm. on the home printer, but it will never print as well in CMYK as it does from RGB on a home kind of photo stylist mm-hmm. printer. Yeah. Um, I'll add one more little addition to Jake's thing with the convert um, from from RGB to CMYK. Um, there's a better way to do that, Jake. Mm-hmm. So you're going to learn a little something here too. Instead, <laughs> when you switch from <laughs> RGB to CMYK using under image, if you guys are familiar with Photoshop, you go under image and you go to mode and you can just pick between RGB, CMYK. There's a couple of other things too there that nobody uses. Um it sort of forces it into that space mm-hmm. and it does it in a kind of a clumsier way. Um, when you're, when you're getting ready for print, the, the, the more fluid way, if you want the CMYK one to look like the RGB one, uh, you'll get a better result. If you go to under edit in Photoshop, you go to convert to profile at the bottom. And if you click on that, it'll bring up a profile, you grab it. And then there is a profile and they're called working CMYK. It's called us web coded You'll see it there at the, at the top. It's a stock um, profile. That's a, It's a CMYK profile made for printing. Mm. And if you click that, it'll automatically do the conversion and you get a little bit closer to your RGB file. So do you want to do that after after you flatten it? Or does it it'll automatically flatten it? There's a button there that just says flatten uh-huh. and then that'll be default checked you definitely do want to do that i agree with what you're saying there you can't keep all your layers when you make that conversion but there's a button within there so you don't have to manually flatten it and then go do this to go over to export that little button is automatically checked you have to uncheck it if you don't want it for some reason um but it's a smoother conversion and then it also gets it ready for print uh in a little bit better way it doesn't it doesn't force it in the same way okay but if you do that be prepared for a white van to pull up across the street from you because you're venturing into territories you may not have the rights to an adobe to. van <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i know this stuff sounds a little techy but it does it does pay to kind of dive into this stuff um maybe we just need to have like a simple kind of class on it where i can maybe me and jake can do it and go into it and chat about it just like this but show you guys the screen and the photoshop file because it's only a few things that you need to know but if you don't know them it can really really affect the way things print yeah Cool. So maybe we'll do that. Maybe. Definitely don't want Will doing that. Just you. No. 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 When he I, said I, you, I left when, Will you know, and I wasn't offended. That was, that was not an accident. I wasn't offended when you said me and Jake because I'm like, you guys can have your little tech party off to the side. Leave me out. I, I, that's not my world. I can't no. Not. Every I time we to, start, every time we start this uh, this podcast, we have to do a different thing to get even Will involved in it because his <laughs> system's so different. And yet, <laughs> and yet, I have a real mic. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> My mic died a few years ago. <laughs> I know. We were. We all have our strengths. Will wouldn't have recorded have today strengths. if we didn't say, "Hey, Will, get on." We were talking about Bitcoin. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am the Bitcoin him. guy, aren't I? He's he's his he's swimming in his giant Scrooge McDuck vault with with uh with the giant bitcoins in there and he's just <laughs> spitting them out of his mouth. Okay, next question. <laughs> uh this comes from Jonathan titled Copyright slash trademark question. Dear Jake, Will and Lee. First of all, he, he, he starts with a compliment. This guy knows how to butter us up. First nice. of all, I want to thank you for all that you guys do. The classes on SVS that I have viewed thus far have made me realize I've still got a lot to learn, and it's possible to learn it. So I appreciate that, Jonathan. Thank you for that. So his question is this. How frequently should I be registering works for copyright and titles slash names for trademarks? It makes sense that one shouldn't copyright every piece of art that one creates. It would take too much time and money. So should one just focus on copywriting the big projects? When should one do this? When the project is first created or after it's found its audience? And when should one worry about trademarking? I've just begun some of the business classes that SVS has, specifically at least how to make money in the illustra- in illustration series. So these topics could be talked about there and I haven't realized it yet. I'm not ready to publish any works myself in terms of both my skill level and the fact that none of my projects are completed, but I've always been curious about the business side of things. So he says, thank you in advance and have a wonderful day. Um, So first off, let's just the difference between trademark and copyright. 
right? So copyright is for any creative work that you do. So it's a story. It's, um, uh, you know, it could be a class that you teach. It could be a song that you write. Um, it could be a melody, you know, those are all copyright. It's a, it's a, a illustration that you made. That's copyright. It's a creative work. A trademark is the mark by which you do business. Okay. So for example, I have a JP logo that I put on my, um, Instagram account profile. I put it on my shop. I put it on my books. When I print a book, it's on my little postcards that I put in my, in my bookmarks that I put in the orders that I ship out. And that JP logo is my, is my trademark. Um, and that essentially is me saying I'm doing business under this logo. And when somebody receives a thing with this logo on it, they, um, they're getting something from from me. And they know it's mm -hmm. not coming from Will Terry. Have or, you have or, you paid to trademark it? I have not paid to trademark the JP logo. No. So but, I, I had to I had to bust you mm -hmm. on purpose. <laughs> right. So let's <laughs> let's get into that. Uh, I have trademarked another logo. I trademarked the Inktober logo. And the way that I went about doing that was this was a logo that I created to represent the Inktober challenge, but more specifically to represent any Inktober stuff that was being made under the Inktober, I guess, name. So um, coming from, from myself or the crew that I have doing Inktober stuff. So if we did an Inktober t-shirt with the logo on it, it would be that Inktober logo. If we did um, an Inktober book that was specifically from, from you know, myself, it had that logo on it. Um, and so I trademarked that logo. I didn't necessarily trademark the word Inktober, but I trademarked that logo so that someone else couldn't use a logo that I, this logo that I designed and sell a t-shirt or sell a, um, a book using that logo. The way that you trademark something is you add a little TM next to it. <clears throat> and all that, all that means is you're sort of planting a flag saying, this is this is a thing that I own and I'm doing business under, right? This little this little mark that I made. And just putting that TM, you don't have to pay for a TM. <clears throat> you don't have to fill out a form with the government for a TM. Just by putting it on there, it's sort of your legal stamp your legal flag in the wait, ground that says- Wait, wait, are you sure? Like just by writing the TM mm -hmm. with nothing registered or anything, right. it, that counts as something? Right, It it and that, and that could hold up in court. If you have proof saying that, look, here I use this logo with this TM next to it on this date, and it was before these other people used it and and used it for their, their thing, you know, that would, that would definitely hold up. Now, the R with a circle, that's for trademarks that you've registered and you've paid money to the U.S. government to say, or to the European government or any other government. You've paid money to them saying, I'd like to register this trademark with you so that um, it can be protected essentially under actual, you know, under, under law. It's just a, a more solid form of, of protection. And you see, that's why you see the R on a lot of big, big brands or anybody who's really like going to town on selling stuff using their, um, using their, their trademark. Um, the reason I haven't done that with JP and I haven't done that with, uh, you know, uh, any, you know, we haven't done that with the SVS logo is really, we don't see other people <laughs> adopting those logos for, for their needs. Or, or right. you know, we don't see another school coming along using a rabbit logo, selling selling their stuff, or or you know, <clears throat> or um, why why wouldn't a logo automatically be trademarked the way it is copyrighted? What do you mean the way it's copy? Oh, I mean, uh, without, you know, it's, without it's adding naturally the TM, already without adding the yeah. TM, even without adding the TM, the I think the TM kind of projects that you know what you're doing. <laughs> 
you know? Well, in, in <laughs> just, that you've also So it's just said, posturing. It's like, uh, yeah, you've also just... <laughs> basically flexed and said, look, mm-hmm. don't, don't come around. But what you're talking about, Lee, that you need, you need to, you need to go into that. Cause it was really subtle. What you said, you said, why isn't it automatic like copyright? And a lot of people don't know that about copyright, that it's automatic mm-hmm. when you create something, you should talk about mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so that's a trademark. Going back to copyright, as soon as you put something out into the world that you created, you post it on Instagram or you post it on your website or you print it and you sell a print or or any any of those things, as long as it's you can prove that you were the first person to create that, um, and there's no other examples of that thing that you created existing prior to it, then you have a a copyright for that the Mm -hmm. only time that you would like the only time that i've ever registered actually registered a copyright where it was in relation to some uh publishing projects that i did with a with a publisher and that was sort of standard procedure for them um otherwise i in any book that i do that i've come out with self-published i'll just add copyright the year you know um Jake Parker or my, my business, you know, JP creative. And, um, and that sort of, I guess, covers you. The, the problem with all of this though, is enforcing it and how much do you really Mm -hmm. want to enforce it and how much is it worth to enforce it? People are going to use ideas and they're going to mix your ideas with their ideas and they're going to spread stuff around and, and typically just reaching out and saying, Hey, I think, I think you use something of mine is a good way to like handle, handle that situation. Um, if that doesn't work, you can call them out, you know, publicly, or you can have a lawyer approach them. But at the end of the day, um, unless this thing is a huge money maker for you, I think you're going to spend a lot of money enforcing something that, um, that, you might not get a return on. Yeah, it's a good point. I'll add a little little story here. Like people are always saying, "Oh, you should sue. You should sue." When something happens, that you guys should Google "modern dog" um, copyright infringement case. Do mm-hmm. you guys know anything about that? Mm-mm. Hit, hit That's us. The give, one. Us so the, modern, give us the short version. Modern Modern Dog is a graphic design company, very well known, and they put out this book, and it, and I can't remember what the content of the book was, but they had uh, all these dog portraits that they had done that's in the book printed. And then a company had stolen those, those exact portraits and started selling them um, as their, as their own. So modern dog went after this company. And I mean, it was, it was, you know, open and shut case. It took modern dog, like, you know, I'm just guessing here five years or something Do you know, Google it. You can find the actual, the actual details. It almost bankrupted them trying to go after this case to get this company to stop using these images. Um, and this is it's a huge company and, and it was an easy case to see. Yeah, they stole it. And so I think it's just uh, people underestimate when they say, I'll oh, go sue somebody because mm-hmm. they took well, something. The, years. the other thing that people don't understand when they say that, when they say just go sue somebody, they don't understand that you can completely win a judgment and the person that you win the judgment or the company you win the judgment against, um, if they decide so what you want a judgment they don't have to pay you i mean they're they're legally they're supposed to pay you well what if they don't well then you have to take them back to court again and the judge goes yeah you guys were supposed to pay these guys how come you haven't paid them and and they can shrug they can say whatever and then the judge goes well i i double find you guilty of of, you you have have to pay even more and then they don't pay again and so then you have to hire a company to attach their wages or to go after collections, a collections company to go after them. And they can simply all at that point, they're banking on that, by the way. And at that point they bankrupt that company and they start a new one and they don't pay you. I mean, and and, and that's (laughs) the thing. And that's the, the, so I have this theory that goes like this. Show me the person that has copyrighted, uh, that has registered their copyright because your copyright is is um, assumed when you create the work. You mm-hmm. own the copyright. You don't have to put a C. The C actually makes you look amateur. 
you don't have to put that in your in you know in your on your on your piece but i have a, a theory that there's a direct correlation between the quality of the work and people that actually register their copyright mm-hmm. and it, and i think that your work the work that is registered looks bad the 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 copyright office is probably like there aren't any good artists out there because the, <laughs> because because people that are i mean do you guys register your copyrights no no one does I never have. especially not the good artists it's it's and and people will will say and i will get i will get emails and say well will i know a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who won a lawsuit and stuff sure there are cases where people got paid i can tell you five people I can give you five cases of people who were directly infringed upon, had a cut and dry case. A couple of them took it to court and lo- and won, but never got paid. Like I'm telling you. Mm-hmm. And uh, one, meanwhile, they're out all that money for suing. Yeah, uh, and one guy that. paid a lawyer. One guy, a friend of mine, Boris Lubner, paid uh, two different attorneys to go after Sizzler. And I, I've I've I put this on my YouTube uh, years ago told mm-hmm. this whole story about how he uh, was, was um, I mean, in a nutshell, he was going to do these menu boards for a franchise owner who owned five Sizzler restaurants in Utah. And that's, that's all in his contract. It was clear. The, this artwork is for five menu boards in Utah, period. His friend calls him from Florida. Nice job on the Sizzler menu. So he knew he had a problem. Ooh. And then he finds out that Sizzler liked it so much that they just took it and used it nationally and sizzler decided not to pay this guy and they they went they stopped they wouldn't return his calls they they blamed the ad agency the ad agency said no sizzler was the one who wanted it you know and so it was Mm -hmm. a back and forth and then his attorney his first attorney fired it said boris these guys have decided to outspend you so i would fire me You've paid me ten thousand dollars already. Second attorney, he pays him twelve thousand dollars. Attorney says, "You need to fire me. You can't afford this. They, they've, they're going to outspend you. They, I've seen these cases before. They've just decided they'd rather give their your money to their attorneys than to you, which I think is despicable. <laughs> right. But you know, why not just pay the artist and say, you know, we are bad, and they could have just given him the money. I, I never understand that, by the way, why people don't just. I, I just can't understand why they wouldn't do more of the right thing there and just just say, you know, you caught us. We shouldn't have done that. And just here's we will you go away for this amount of money? <laughs> but they don't. We live in this litigious society. So I, I just think and I know I'm on a soapbox right now, mm-hmm. but I think red, re, registering your copyright. Yes, it allows you to sue for triple the damages. So if you can prove damages in a court of law and you did not register your copyright, you might be able to get let's say. You could say, well, I, I had this many sales on my site. You have to show track record. Mm-hmm. And and this company took the, this many sales away. So I, I want to say that I was damaged $5,000 by this. And the judge might go, okay, great. Um, I find in your favor for $5,000. Well, if you register your copyright, he can say, well, I, since I find for you in $5,000, I will then award you fifteen. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. or you can ask for fifteen based on five thousand dollars damages, mm-hmm. and and you can't do that if you haven't registered it. Mm-hmm. But I don't, uh, you know, and I've been an illustrator for for thirty years. I don't know anyone, any artist who's ever uh, been infringed upon, and who has won a settlement or a judgment. I just don't know mm-hmm. anybody. Mm-hmm. I know they're out there. I know some people have. The other thing too with with copyright. I, um, I listened to this podcast called Akimbo. It's by a guy named Seth Godin. Mm-hmm. And he actually just recently did um, an episode called Copyrights and Trademarks. And I recommend any of you who are interested in this to go listen to that episode because he explains things a lot better than we do. But one of the examples he gives in that is what a copyright actually covers. So he's like, a person can write a book for kids and have it be about a boy wizard who goes away to school and learns how to be a wizard. And, um, you know, he could even have a scar on his forehead and wear (laughs) glasses and live under a, you know, a a staircase. Mm -hmm. But copyright doesn't cover ideas. What it does cover is what you've actually, like, what you've actually written down. The words themselves. So you couldn't do that and also name your wizard Harry 
Potter. He couldn't go to a school named Hogwarts. He couldn't have a friend named Hermione. You know, you couldn't use the same words that J.K. Rowling put down, but you could essentially do a, a book about school wizards, right? And so there's uh, a bunch of those right now, actually. If you noticed, yeah. there's a bunch. If yeah. you have kids that are about 10 to 14, there's a bunch of series with kids at these magic schools it's, right now. It's kind of funny. It's a new the genre, series. essentially. <laughs> it, it really is. It really is. There's a slippery slope that I wanted to just add, add tack on to what Will was saying there. Almost like it's a, it's sort of a losing battle. I hate to say it. It's, and, and we're sort of exposing that reality. Everybody thinks, oh, I got a copyright. I'm going to sue if somebody steals it or whatever. And that's the sort of the agreed upon belief that a contract actually works. I know, I know our teacher, David Hone is going to freak out when he hears this. <laughs> he loves contracts so much. If you have a contract and somebody really doesn't want to pay it, what truly is the recourse there right. mm -hmm. without spending hundred thousand right. dollars in court to try to get your three thousand dollars all a contract is is agreed upon thing you got to cross your fingers that they're going to pay it right um because if they decide not to you're not getting it mm -hmm. i mean it's sort of just a a belief I, I, and <laughs> see, i'm a pay. realist and so like one of the things that i i don't do is i don't buy extended warranties on almost everything i own now if, the, if i buy something like like that, that has a lot of moving parts that can wear out. I will buy an, a warranty for that, but it's rare, right? But for most things, what I've done is I've said, if I don't buy an extended warranty on everything, then when that one thing goes wrong, sure, I'll have to replace it and I'll have to pay out of my pocket and it's going to cost and it's going to suck. But if I add up all the money I save from all the extended warranties, I'm ahead. And, it, and it's always been that way. Same for me with copyright. How much time will it take you to register, I've, I've done you know close to three thousand um, illustrations. So how much time if I had to if I had to fill out the paperwork for each one? And I and I know you can do groups, you can do batches, but then there's the cost. There's you have to also spend some money. And so for me, the time and money, like right now, since I've never I've never had a a large company or even a medium or small size company steal my stuff. I've never ever had a case where I would consider taking someone to court. I've had a lot of individual artists steal my stuff and I've seen my stuff constantly. People send me stuff that's on Fiverr and the person lives in Bangladesh or some, you know, something, some place that's really far away, you know, or, or the Philippines or something like that. I'm, I'm not going to sue somebody in the Philippines because they stole my stuff and put it on <laughs> Fiverr. Therefore, I'm, I'm also not going to register my copyright in the United States and hope that that somehow protects me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it, it's, I'm a real, I, I live in the real world. There's going to be loss mm -hmm. and, and it's okay. I'm, mm -hmm. I sleep well at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. We beat this subject up. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> we went off. We, we went off. I got, I got all passionate there. Don't waste your time like copywriting, it. man. I like it. Uh, I think that's it. That's it for today. So uh, we'll, we'll cool. wrap it up we, right we, here. We have to end on copyright. See, um, I could go dig yeah, well, so, up another so question two, really quick. Yeah, Are so you, our two, okay, let me ask, our two let me ask conversations the, were files on saving files and copyright. No, and let me amateur. ask the final question. <laughs> what? what, what Oh, that's right. I forgot about the amateur question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask the All final right, question. Good. What are you guys going to do for fun today? Just one thing that you're going to do for fun. Tennessee is covered in snow right now. So we are going to go sledding. <laughs> going oh, sledding. Cool. As, as per usual, past cool. couple of days. Um, my, uh, my, I, I donate some time on Wednesday nights to my church, um, teaching a, a youth group how to do stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we do activities. So tonight, it's Wednesday night. They're all coming over to my house and we're teaching them. My wife's going to teach them how to make spring rolls. So these are all like 12 year old boys <laughs> and they're oh. all going to learn how to make spring wow. rolls tonight. So nice. Cool. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's what we're doing tonight. Should be fun. We'll cool. see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, all right then. What are you doing? I'm not doing anything fun. Why'd you ask that secret question? <laughs> no, we're gonna we're gonna go uh, ride our mountain bikes on the trail. Okay, oh, that fun. sounds good. 
That sounds good. All right, I'll take us out. Now, now we can end. Now we can end. Where is my taking out script? I just had it. Here it is. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Um, your hosts today have been Will Terry, Lee White, and myself. I'm Jake Parker. And um, Will Terry, if you want to find his artwork, <coughs> Go on Instagram. You're going to go to at Will Terry Art on Instagram. You can check it out. Really doesn't matter though because it doesn't post on Instagram anymore. It's kind of done <laughs> with social media. I've been writing. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just I don't know. go to Lee White uh, Illo at at um, on Instagram to see Lee's posts. The guy posts daily. It seems like he's he's so prolific on there. He's always posting. Post How often do you? I don't want to one. I'm a once a weeker He's kind a of guy weaker. right now. I want to, I want to be more, but once yeah. a week. And then I'm Jake part at Jake Parker on Instagram. And some weeks I'm posting every day and some weeks I completely neglect it. So we'll see what, what week it is this time. Podcast is produced by Daniel two. That's Daniel T U. And you could find him at Daniel two.co. So check out his website there. And uh, special thanks to our SVS learn production manager david bro who helps us out with all kinds of stuff making sure things get get done and done properly and thank you to our social media specialist lisa fott for all of her work that she does as well so if you like this episode please share it around um you know you might know someone who's interested in one of these topics and if this helps them do not hesitate to to pass this episode along to them we also like it if you left a review love to hear what you think we read those and and um and we, we like to know how we can improve the podcast or what we should keep doing to make it good and helpful and useful to you. Now, if you're wanting to join in on this discussion, we've posted about it in our forum on svslearn.com. Just click on forum, free to join. You have something you want to add to it, uh, something you disagree with us, just go and find the, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, thread for this episode and chime in over there and let us let us know what you think and i think that's it thank you everybody and we will see you next time